Bom dia. Tudo bem? I'm learning Portuguese, and this is obviously prim primitive, but I'll try. So it's a really great pleasure to be here again. I've been at Google pretty much most of the week. I feel like I live here uh, doing the other think tanks, and it's been really interesting. Um, obviously, listening to the other presentations, you know, earlier this week and also this one, one thing is for certain that, in my view, the future of information is not information, it's experience. Finding a way to visualize, contextualize, and create context and meaning. So you could say, for example, the future of Twitter, you know, the reality of uh, Twitter now is noise. I mean, it's nice noise, but it's noise. The future of Twitter is meaning. So how do we do this? I think there's a lot of discussion about how we can add value to products to make them more meaningful. And so my job as a futurist is to help people sort of anticipate the trends that are coming. Um, I'm heavily involved in travel, of course, not just because of my work. I'll show you in a second. But also I work with clients who are in the travel business, hotel chains and airlines and tourist organizations. Because my view is that because we're moving into a fully digital world, to where we're always on and connected, we're going to cherish those ex experiences even more. And we're going to have more the need to actually get together and meet, even though we have video conferences and teleportation and all these things. So as a traveler, I last, in 2011, I flew 60% of the miles of an airline captain. Uh, last year, I actually flew more miles than a captain. This was the year before. I also learned a lot by staying in really bad hotels where you have to use your own imagination to heat up your food. So I have some personal experience to share there. But let's ask the question first, what is a futurista, which is a great word here uh, in Brazil. I like much better than a futurist, actually. <laughs> uh, so my work is to look a little bit into the future, three to five years. I'm not doing the work of, say, Alvin Toffler or Ray Kurzweil that you may know. I wish I could, but most of my work is three to five years. And I try to make the future touchable. So my job today is for you is to uh, give you a point, a touching point, to where you can reach the future. Most of that you will already know, because clearly, you know, if you're not, uh, if you haven't lived in the North Pole for the last five years, you know that mobile is becoming really important <laughs> and things like that. So that's kind of the present and also the future. It's really kind of both. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So. If what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll fail completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable, have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. This is Arthur C. Clarke, 1941. Okay. So I want to be unreasonable with you today. I'm, I'm not here to give you recipes or to give you prediction. I'm not Nostradamus. But I would like you to, to think about how can you can actually make a huge difference in what you do rather than put a small minor change on it. First of all, what we have to face is that what I call the digital default is coming. If you're looking at this graph, global population, roughly 8 billion people, probably even more by 2020, and over 60% of those people connected to the internet. And that is also here in Brazil. Right now, you know, the numbers are not so hot in Brazil. They're they're, they're good in general, but you know, 50% of Brazilians, I think, are 50 million. So that's not 50%, that's, not that's a lot less, 25%, and 10% on mobile. So it still has a long way to grow. But Brazil is the number one country in the world for the growth of the internet from year to year. So it's very interesting to see that now we're becoming what's called a digital society. And even people who only have $5 can buy a tablet. In India, the Akash tablet costs $31. And very soon, Amazon will make the Kindle free. Because if you buy five books, the, the box is free. The box costs $5, not a big problem. Right? So digital default will be not subject to having money. And that's a big change. Right? And that is coming in the next three to five years. So basically what that means for businesses, it means this, transformation. It does not mean putting another antenna on your car or a different tire. Right? It means becoming a different company, a different entity. And there is the shift that we're going to see in the next three to five years. Because of all this, all of us will have radical transformation, including, of course, what's called cloud computing. Everything that we do, our music, our movies, our health records, our education, 
is moving into this thing called the cloud. And this cloud, to a large extent, will be local, like Brazilian clouds we have as well, but to 80% right now they're American clouds, and that will really change also. But anyway, everything in the cloud means that all my travel information, all of my confidential information, all of my driving records, and people have different levels of access. So you can, ima you can imagine this brings up a huge amount of privacy issues. Right? But if you don't share information, then Google can't do all the cool things that they want to do. Right? Like they showed you earlier, if Google doesn't, doesn't know who I am, of course they couldn't do that. So cloud computing, moving information to the cloud is a very big deal. And the real challenge for us is this. We're now living in a world that is vastly exponential because of technology. And Ray Kurzweil says basically, what is happening today, we can't possibly understand technology in the same way because we are human. We're linear. We're counting one, two, three, four, five. And I'm not going to think 10 times as fast in 18 months just because I use Twitter. Right? It's not possible. So as much as I can try, I'm not going to be like a machine because machines are exponential. One, two, four, eight, 16, 32. When you count to 100 exponentially, you get to a billion. Okay. Right now, here in Brazil and also on a global level, we're shortly before this takeoff point. We're at, five, at four, and the next point is not five, it's eight. And in 32 months, in less than in three years, less than three years, you'll be at 32. Because the numbers are mind boggling. So, Exponential change is a challenge. We have to really start thinking about where is the travel business going to go? Where is tourism going to go? Are we going to continue to travel like we have? Will business travel evolve in the same way? I mean, look into the numbers again. Brazil is the leader in internet growth. Will tomorrow's world be just an extension of today's world? Well, the answer is pretty safe to say, definitely not. Will we have 10 times as many cars in Sao Paulo than we have today? God forbid. Right? But will we have car sharing? Right? Will we have public cars? Google has a, the self-driving car initiative. It is certain that in 10 years, most major cities will have public, electric, self-driving cars like we know from Robocop or Blade Runner. Right? That's a certainty, because technology exists. <coughs> so think about that for tourism. What that means is an absolute mobility revolution. Everything is becoming mobile. The information, the booking, the, the sharing devices, Google Glass, internet on your iris. So within three to five years, 50% of all internet access in developed countries, and I'm counting Brazil now as a developed country, you know, sorry to tell you, but <laughs> that is the reality. Yeah? So, will be done on mobile devices. If you're today sitting here and your website isn't mobile, you know, this is the first thing you should do tomorrow morning, or of course, you know that. Right? But mobile commerce, all the things that are happening on mobile will be mind-boggling explosive. So travel now is becoming a really interesting business. On a global level, you know, of course, that what is referred to as the long tail, you know, a lot more people are going to a lot more different places. So mainstream is going like this. People are not just going to Las Vegas to have fun, you know, they can go to a hundred places now to, to do that. And the choices are endless. Even if you're a student in Europe, you can go to Thailand for the same price you can go to, to Spain. Right. Now it's becoming obvious, you know, for example, if you're looking at the, these graphs from eMarketer, you're seeing quite clearly here that the, uh, the amount of travel sales in developing countries, in the BRIC countries, even though Brazil doesn't really count there, is explosive. And the same goes here, a little bit hard to see. You can download, by the way, the PDF later on my website, futuristgerd.com, like G-E-R-D, futuristgerd.com. You can take a good look at these stats. So I'm going to borrow the Nike commercial and propose to you that you need to find your mobile greatness. The Nike commercial being find your greatness, I'll just amend slightly. Okay. Find your mobile greatness. What is that? How are you going to look like for people when they use mobile devices? Now, what's, the, what's the user experience? Because now, we're moving into the future, as we know from ourselves, the people formerly known as consumers. We're not just consumers anymore. We're, we're participants. We're a jury for hotels. 
We're rating our doctors. We're contributing information. In fact, you could say that the metadata, which is all the stuff that we generate, the likes and the, the browsing history and the location, the metadata is becoming just as important as the data. This is why everybody wants us to like them, you know, on various other places that we won't mention here. So, the people formerly known as consumers, now in Brazil, you know what that means, right? It means we're getting off our couch. We're no longer just taking things and accepting them as reality forever. And that's a global trend, you know, and this has a real impact on us for business reasons. Uh, uh, privately, we're very happy about having more power, but as businesses, increased consumer power is a pain yeah? because we're subject to more criticism. Give you an example. Uh, last year, I was in a, in a hotel called the Knight Hotel in New York. I definitely recommend you don't go there. And I booked it through Tablet Hotels, which is a website that I use. And it turned out to be rather awful. So I, I'm a senior reviewer on TripAdvisor. It's my ongoing experiment about whether it's all lies or whether it's real. I contribute to TripAdvisor. So I, I wrote a review on TripAdvisor about this hotel, as you can see there. And in a very short time, like half an hour later, I got an email from the organization from... Uh, from the tablet hotel saying that if this hotel goes below the rating one more time, we will take them off the list of recommended places. Because they looked at my social rating, they looked at my TripAdvisor status, they looked at my other public stuff and said, well, this guy must be something about this. Right? So this hotel instantly, one more time, they're off the list. Right? And this is happening on the global scale. It happens to politicians, as you know. It happens to companies, happens to airlines, happens to record labels, happens everywhere. It's empowerment. So as a business, what is the best course for your future is to radically empower your customers. In fact, it's the only way forward. And the, the Amazon paradigm of doing this, Jeff Bezos calls this customer delight. That's all that matters. So if you take home one thing from today, delight your customer. That is the key for the future. I mean, if you're looking at what's happening here, going back to my nice little video here from Joshua Tree, California, what happens most in the future is to experience things. You can send people huge amounts of information about how great this place is, but really, how they're going to decide what to do is an emotional decision. Right? It has to have an impact. If it doesn't have impact, it's just noise. So whatever you do in terms of presenting things, you know, Shoot for the experience, because now we have a global transformation that's driven by the digital culture, from product to service to experience. If your hotel or your airline isn't an experience, I don't care. I'm not interested in your product or the price. This is why it's wrong to put this buy button everywhere and just scream at people, please give me money. They'll give you money when they're ready, when the experience is correct. So look at the, the shift here from computers to tablets, to Google Glass, computing is becoming an experience, right? without an interface. You compute just by saying something, as we will see later. So becoming an experience, the other thing is, of course, your mobile phones. My good friend Michael Douglas from the old days. SIM cards, bundled <laughs> music as a service, and lastly, the mobile world as an experience that we go into. In fact, you could argue this mobile experience is so good, it's addictive. I mean, I'm sure you would agree. Right? When we are sitting together having dinner, people are going like this on their Blackberry, whatever Blackberry is now. But, you know, so it's addictive, right? I mean, this is clearly becoming an experience. So I would propose to you here in Brazil, and this would be a top goal for whatever you're doing, promoting Brazil, realness matters. Because you could think, when you think about the virtual world, that all matters is connectivity or some dressing up of data. But this here on the left is a design for the future island of the Maldives. Right? Why are they doing this? Because climate change is wiping out the Maldives, you know, rising waters. So they're proposing to build this. Here on the right is the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas, which is a great place. Now, 68% of Americans that go here say they're not going to go to Venice because this is just as good. Can you imagine that? Right? That's the world we don't want. <laughs> Realness matters. And if you have something real to offer, I think that's the future rather than making a copy of it. 
But here's the tough part. We're living now in a world where we used to separate the physical things, you know, real life, or what people call the meat space, um, to cyberspace and digital. That was, I don't know, a hundred years ago. <laughs> now this is becoming so close that basically it's melting together. There is no difference between online and offline. This is just a mental state. In three to five years from now, this will be completely converged. So whatever your strategy is, there is no such thing as a digital strategy. That would be like saying, I have a water strategy when you have a house. Right? The internet is like electricity. It's a little bit far-fetched, of course, for Brazil to say, when you drive outside the city, you don't get any 3G signal. Right? But that will change very quickly and dramatically. So the other thing I want to impress on you is whatever cool tech you're inventing and whatever cool SEO you have and other things that you're doing to build a better business, it comes down to one thing. Trust. People will do anything if they trust you, or they will do absolutely nothing if they don't trust you. So whatever technology you use, it has to convey trust. And this is why real-time information and, and conversations are so important, because trust is usually done with some sort of transparency. You make a mistake, it's okay. You can admit it, it's okay. You provide wrong information, you can change it. But uh, technology needs to be based on trust. And this is the number one mission when we use technology, is to convey trust so we can get a transaction. Because without trust, there is no transaction. So the other thing that's happening, is I'm sure you're aware of this, is that technology is becoming so good and so powerful <coughs> that we're looking at the rise of artificial intelligence. And this sounds kind of science fiction. But when you're speaking in your mobile phone and says, Google, look for XYZ location, that's artificial intelligence. If somebody suggests to you another web page when you're browsing because of the cookie on the browser, that's a primitive form of artificial intelligence. So smart software agents that will go out and fetch information, that's what we just saw in the, in the demonstration earlier, that's what we can fully expect in the next couple of years. Very powerful technology. Digital butlers, you know, fetching things for us. This leads me to a very important topic. You've seen in the press, of course, the last couple of months, the topic of big data. Big data means nothing else but what it used to mean, a lot of data, but you know, if you're looking at five years ago, it was down here, now, now it's up here. The amount of data that we are generating. Location, likes, favorites, referrals, browsing, web pages, information sharing, uploading, you know, it's exploding. So we are in the aggregate, the two and a half billion people on the internet, we are essentially the content of all these places. And of course, remember there's a saying that, uh, that says, if you don't pay, you are the content. So we are the content, in fact, of search, we're also the content of Facebook. But what's happening here is that we have an un, uh, unprecedented amount of variety, volume, velocity of this data. And if you're in business today, you need a data strategy. What do you do with the user's data? Who figures out who connects to who? How do you get to them? What permissions do you have? I can't tell you how many times I've been in hotels all over the world, the same hotels like maybe 10 times in a row, 10 or 12 times in a row, and they still don't know who I am. Can you imagine that? I mean, to use uh, Avinash's favorite word, it sucks. Right? I mean, they should know who I am not by tracking me or so, but by finding a mechanism of some sort. Right? So big data is absolutely crucial, and the future of big data is going to look like this, essentially. Data in the middle of everything we do. That doesn't mean that we won't use our human judgment to create a human experience. But collecting data and doing things, you know, increasing the amount of business intelligence, those tools are widely available now. Social media monitoring, tracking, looking at all these things. I mean, this is basically also a way of predicting things. Prediction technology is now becoming rapidly a standard, not prediction in terms of very long term, but predicting demand and therefore acting differently. Especially for hotels, this is a big deal. So business intelligence is going real time, real place, social and predictive. And you should get involved with this because there's a huge amount of potential here, also because there's clearly a, a way forward for a lot of different ideas.
So this handshake between humans and machines is our future. That can be very scary. Because, you know, this is actually becoming, this machine is actually becoming very human. Uh, in the sense of, it acts sort of, you know, if you use Siri, for example, it kind of acts like it's human, right? So this interface of humans, big data, artificial intelligence and software, you know, creating intelligent business is a very powerful era for the future. Let me come to one important point. Peter Drucker, fav the famous management guru, uh, said that in the greatest danger in times of change and turbulence is not the turbulence, but is to act with yesterday's logic. How can we possibly make a business plan for three years from now for our businesses if we don't even understand today? So how many people I talk to, especially with big companies, who've never used a mobile for booking anything. So from their point of view, it doesn't matter if it's mobile or not, because it's not their reality. It's all parallel realities. But to act with yesterday's logic, give you some examples. I worked for the music business for a long time. Yesterday's logic in the music <coughs> business was to say, we don't allow people to download for free because it kills our business. Well, turns out, not true. Turns out, opposite is true. They make it available to everyone under some sort of reasonable license, like Spotify or others, business booms. Right? Wrong logic. TV advertising, disruption. Right? Yelling at people, yesterday's logic. Are you really going to buy something from a company that yells at you through a billboard or through your mobile phone? You'll hate them. Sites that are not mobile optimized, I hate them, I leave. Right? Yesterday's logic. Marketing that creates mousetraps and data that's useless. I mean, yesterday's logic is interesting only until last week. So, it's kind of deadly to act based on yesterday's logic. But of course then, you don't know tomorrow's logic because it doesn't exist. So what you need to do is to create tomorrow's logic. Get away from this thinking of scarcity. This is also yesterday's logic. Scars money, scars travel, scars connections. Now we have abundance. You know, we have every possible option. So look at kind of a new logic there. This is Burning Man. I know you've been to Burning Man in California, but this is me over... No, just kidding, it's not me. But <laughs> I wish it was. I mean, I've been to Burning Man, but I didn't take a photo. So... Defining a new logic in your company takes imagination. It takes playfulness, it takes dis discovery. If you don't allow your staff to discover anything, if you block all the other stuff from their networks, if you make them work exactly by the minute on exact plans, of course, how are they ever going to discover the future? It requires this. It requires the possibility of thinking something that doesn't exist, like going in a car on a freeway and, and uh, playing chess. And this is the reality we have now with, you know, with the uh, self-driving car. So, for the CEOs, and hopefully uh, some CEOs here as well, and uh, human resources, we have to set our teams free to discover that logic. That's crucial. So, if it's not happening in your company, go home and ask to be set free, otherwise you could quit. Right. Because it won't work. Right? We need to have a space to discover what's happening next. Let's talk about advertising. As you know, good old-fashioned advertising, roughly a $650 million business, or no, billion dollar business, a huge business, is dramatically changing. It goes from the old business of lying, you know, like this Coke ad, of yelling, of watering, canning everyone with the same information, and yelling through the web, and it goes to a new business, and that business is getting inside people's head. And worse or better, you could say, inside people's heart. Advertising today means you have to find a direct path into that door that is made open for you. You don't come with a, with a cannon and blow a hole. Right? You take the, the opening that's there and you provide meaningful information. So advertising becomes content. Advertising becomes a meaningful addition to your life, ideally speaking, can't always be done, of course. Right? This is a tall order. 
But now advertising is changing to be a magnet, to be useful. And how do you do that? I mean, you create value through advertising. Great, lots of great examples, starting with BMWfilms.com, that created movies around BMWs, you know, six years ago. And of course, apps and experiences, or making searching fun, like the previous clip showed. And it's all about this social, local, mobile. Solomo, right, as the abbreviation goes. So advertising is now changing from this, you know, and if you are in this mode of the watering can, you use television, print, and radio, and sometimes that's useful, because you want to read it, everyone, and you have the budget. But really what you want in the future for advertising is this. You want to have a sprinkler system. You want to reach the exact people that have this profile, that are interested at the moment, that are ready for action or ready for interest, you want to be able to involve them. So it goes from pushing and yelling and lying, which advertising to a large degree has always been about lying, about stuff that really wasn't true, right? now to pulling, involving and sprinkling. And there's many ways of doing this, I'll show you a couple of them. Oops, sorry. First, a quick movie, I think that's really important to question what we do and what we're assuming about our reality. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. To your call. Yeah, so the alleged ship was a lighthouse. So the question I have for you, sorry about this, uh, was supposed to stick around there for a while. Um, the question I have for you, which assumptions do we have about our business? And are they still true? And this is the most common problem when we're looking at you know, building our future and creating future scenarios, is that we're taking today's assumption and we're just leaving them there, and then we put some future on top. But the assumptions of the future are different. I'll give you one example. The global, socially conscious, environmentally oriented consumers are exploding. Our assumption is people don't give a damn. Right? They just want to have a nice vacation somewhere and switch off. Not true. This is a global trend that we're seeing around the world, a trend to what is called people, planet, profit, you know, the triple bottom line. I'm sure you heard about it in various other publications. Right? It's this idea of saying that it's important to cover all of those bases. And this, I would propose to you, could be a winning proposition for tourism in Brazil. Not just ecotourism which is also an interesting scenario. But this tourism based on three things, you know, people, planet, and profit, like, you know, you see in the, in the textile industry, you have an organization called the uh, Sustainable Apparel Coalition that is talking about how you can actually save and, and exchange uh, clothes and not buy new ones and so on and so on. Right? So keep that in mind when you're thinking about this. I think sustainable will become the default requirement in all business, everywhere, travel, cities, tourism, transportation. Building, construction, real estate. And it's not becoming you know, like what it has been sort of a nice to have occasionally. I think this is a major trend that we're seeing around the world. So I want to ask you what you believe. Okay, here on the left, world passenger traffic, annual growth rate, you know, in 2009, obviously it, it, it dived, but everything else looks like more people are going to fly all the time. But I want to tell you that I think in less than five years, we will have environmental surcharges for carbon that will make the ticket twice as expensive because you pay once for the ticket and once for the carbon, the CO2 reduction. That is very likely to happen. You have to decide what you believe. The other thing is we have this global trend on the right. It's called the fear of missing out, FOMO, right? that drives people to go everywhere because they always want to be part of something. 
And then we have the trend on the left from J. Walter Thompson described as the joy of missing out, JOMO. So people are okay with not always being somewhere else, you know, to go to their own country, for example. It's funny, you know, I live in Switzerland, so when I go on the mountains in Switzerland to go hiking, I often meet people from Bali, Indonesia. They say that Switzerland is the best place in the world, and then I go to Bali, okay, and I meet people there, and I'm from Switzerland, why don't I just do the same thing in Switzerland and they stay in Bali, it would be a lot better. But so we have this uh, debate between those two things. So I, I think ultimately it comes down to this, we always have to take a sustainable view in our advertising, in our products, in our business relationships. <coughs> and I think that's kind of a new trend also. Okay, in terms of marketing and, and how we go forward, you know, clearly we're seeing in Brazil the trend towards social, as you know. You know, Brazilians are number two on Facebook and I think number one on Twitter along with Indonesia. So what's happening here is that social is becoming more and more important, including the amount of minutes spent on this. It's clearly a trend towards this uh, concept of interaction before transaction. In other words, you won't sell anything unless you previously had a conversation of some sort, an interaction. That's what I liked about Arvinas' uh, talk yesterday, and he'll talk more about that later, is that this concept of saying, you know, constantly screaming at people, buy, 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 click here, right? When people are not ready to buy then, then you have to have an interaction. You have to think about this a little bit larger. Let's talk about visuality. This is one of those interaction tools. Uh, clearly what we're seeing is that video is exploding. And there's estimations by Cisco saying that about 80% of all internet ad traffic in the next five years will be video. I mean, clearly video is exploding. You can see that all around us, whether it's short form, long form. Here you can see on this chart that the biggest growth in video is in Brazil and uh, the information that people are sharing. And, and uh, Kevin Kelly, the co-founder of Wired, he depicts this trend and says, basically we're going from orality, from speaking, to literacy, to reading, to visuality. Looking at images, slideshows, pictures, augmented reality, visuality. This is a very powerful tool. In other words, if you can be visual with your information and show slides or a 360 view or a video or any sort of augmented information, you should do that. It's kind of interesting to see actually because of technology that a lot of kids don't read much anymore because you know, they can look at pictures or videos. Where that has taken us, I don't know, but visuality is a key trend that you're seeing in advertising, you're seeing it around the world, uh, for example, in, in various things that brands do with their pictures with the Nike channel for women, with all the stuff that's happening with mapping and all these things. So basically, visuality is crucial. Introducing eBay Feed. We created it for Matt and all kinds of passionate people so they can discover new items that are inspired by the things they love. So when Matt enters Italy into Feed, Italy is exactly what he gets. Things like espresso machine, very simple trick that eBay is using. If I'm this guy and I like Italy, then when I come in, I get this huge multimedia show about Italy. I don't actually have to do anything. I mean, this information could be done on your website. You could show your clients exactly what they've been looking for in some sort of uh, interesting slideshow or video feed. So what it comes down there to is a very simple thing. You show things to people, you involve them, and then you sell. And this is also the user empowerment. The user wants to know that you have something to say. So Swiss did this thing, this uh, special um, advertising campaign where you could go, Swiss Air in Switzerland, where you could go and, and sing the song, I'm going to San Francisco, and upload it to YouTube, and the winners would get some tickets. And this was a very powerful campaign. I mean, if you're looking at this old uh, saying from Confucius, it says, tell me and I forget, show me I'll remember, involve me and I'll understand. You want to do all three of those things, but the ultimate way of selling, of getting to a conclusion, is to involve people. Right, going back to the experience, what I said earlier. Right? So when you talk to your CFO and the money people in the company, right, let's propose a different kind of ROI, of return on, on investment. I call this a return on involvement. How involved are people with you? That's going to make the money. It's not meaningful to measure things that don't exist or to use the wrong metrics to measure the wrong results. Social capital shows the same thing. Now there's many hotels already giving upgrades to people who have a high cloud score, if you know this company called Cloud. And 
don't really know what to think of that, but it's, it's a trend. Now there's some research, for example, Edelman had this really great research on, on, on purpose. Um, and the key question in Brazil, Brazil is almost at the top right after India. Right? Uh, if companies make a difference, you buy from them. I mean, look at this stat pretty clearly shows that you are interested in companies' values. So if the company's values don't exist or they're not visible, you know, people are less likely to buy from you. This is clearly a trend that we're seeing on a global scale. Real time, all the time. This is tough, right? But I'm not interested in, in yesterday's information about destinations or restaurants. I'm interested in, in information from today, from a couple of minutes ago. Right? The mechanical age is gone. The digital age is here. A stream of content, live and real-time information, as you see in maps. This explosion in offerings that are real-time, for example, Uber cabs in, in New York, where you can call a cab that's actually a private car, or Airbnb, or hotels tonight. So one thing you can think about is like when you looking at your company, which part of your offering can be made so you can use the internet and create things that didn't previously exist only from that, in real-time, digital-only offerings. I think that's the key. Because one thing is for sure, we're living in a world of disruption. So you basically have two choices. Either you are the ones driving disruption by creating something interesting that disrupts everyone else, or somebody's going to do it for you. So disrupt or be disrupted. That's kind of the choice. I think we need to leap now. Let's go to the tech crew back there. This is the leap moment. Yeah, please go to slide 44, because I'm a little bit out of time. I was vastly optimistic on my speed. But uh, I think we can probably make this work. So let's go to 44, please, and we'll do the summary. Uh, also, I'm uh, available for questions afterwards, but I hope you are a little bit excited about the future and ready to transform. I think what we're seeing here is a huge opportunity, especially here in Brazil, considering the boom times that, that Brazil is going through, but also the reality of the context of where this is going to go. So a summary, all commerce is going visual, mobile, real-time, always on, parenthesis, offline is a luxury, real place, the cloud, social, personalized, fluid, and predictive. A lot of that stuff sounds a little bit like, like science fiction when you can't go online outside of Sao Paulo or so, yeah? but the trends are clear. And preparing for those, I think, is crucial for the, for the immediate future. So here's a short summary of the key points, and then I'll finally get off the stage here. Point number one, future is about transformation. Look at your company and say, what are we going to be in five years, and are we not just going to be in a new building or a new office, or we're going to completely reform what we do? Look at the major car companies. All the car companies are becoming transportation companies. They're realizing it's no longer going to be just about cars, but about transportation and mobility. That's transformation. Exponential world. When you're living in an exponential world, you can't wait and observe. That's what we do in Switzerland, where we're around. Yeah? We have to think about what is next while it's happening. Trust and technology. This is not a separate thing. Digital and physical is becoming the same thing. The mobility revolution. Do a simple exercise. Do all of your work in the next four weeks only with a mobile device. I won't tell you which one. Okay. Then you can find out where we're going with mobile. Visuality. If you can do it with images, you can do it with video, you should. This is a trend that we're seeing on a global scale. Big data. How do you use your data? Which data are you allowed to use? <coughs> are you making intelligent decisions based on data? Personalization, mobility, that's already part of the other thing. When you talk about money, don't think about return on investment. That's the second thought. Think about return on involvement. It is almost certain when you're obsessed with return on investment, you won't get any return. Because you're jumping the gun on the process. So return on involvement is really what we're talking about here. And discover tomorrow's logic. That is a process of finding and moving over. So as Alan Kay, the founder of Intel, says, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. 
That's what I wish to you. Thanks very much for your time.